Hello and welcome to season one of the Turf Shed podcast. I'm Evan Barrows. And I'm Dylan Connolly. And today we are joined by Leo Moran in Reapy's Bar in Toom, behind closed doors, unfortunately. Leo, how are you? Well, it's, I'm, it's very good and it's nice to be here anyway, whether the doors are open or closed. There you go. Thanks it's, for uh, joining us. It's an absolute pleasure to have you, Leo. At all, my pleasure. Welcome to the Turf Shed. The Turf <laughs> Shed. <laughs> this could be the Turf Shed, actually, couldn't it? Yeah. It's like, yeah. yeah, it's that old rustic feel to it. Great place, great place. How, how have you been keeping during the I coronavirus? Can't or <laughs> time is flying. Yeah. I don't know how it's flying and where it went, but it's grand. No yeah. complaints. We're healthy and bits and pieces for doing, so no complaints yeah. at all. Yeah, keeping busy anyway. Are yeah. you writing away? No, I'm very bad at writing now, <laughs> but I, I, I'm I, working lately in the last few years with Parik Stevens, and he's writing all the time, so he's my excuse. It's like, why would I bother when he's doing it so well and so often? <laughs> But well, of course, it's not. You know, it doesn't hold water. But that's my <laughs> excuse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Great. Obviously, a lot of people know about Leo Morn and the career in the Saw Doctors, and all the wonderful places and gigs and things that you achieved. Could you bring us right back to the very beginning of how the Saw Doctors actually happened or formed? The beginning for me would really be Blaze X. Okay. I was about 14 and 1979-ish. And 1977 was an amazing year because punk thing had, had happened and, and exploded and was very exciting. And I'd gone into first year in the CBS in 1977. So when you're 13 and punk happened, it's an amazing, brilliantly uh, coincidental uh, ball of energy so that was very influential on on what I loved I just loved the whole thing and Jimmy McHugh uh, the McHugh's father back the road we road God rest him he brought Squiggly Kilzer Mousy and myself to see the Boomtown Rats in Leisureland on New Year's Eve in 1977 and that was magical that was it like God such excitement and the Boomtown Rats had been on the Late Late Show and Bob Geldof was very controversial uh, a week or two previous to that. So people were saying, oh God, they're troublemakers and there'll be violence at this thing in Galway. But that didn't put Jimmy McHugh off bringing <laughs> three. We were only like um, 14, 13, 12 and 11. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, it was magical. So that was it for me. The excitement that a band can create and just that connection that people have. It's like a, it's a communal type of spiritual experience if you like a great band is and yeah. and that's what I loved and for me it was like the circus come when the circus coming to town when a good band comes to town it's it's this event that's special like and I think from that moment on I just wanted to be a part of it but then we had spoken about starting a band and buying guitars and we got around to that two years later with the McHugh brothers Mousy and Cuser. I wanted to be the bass player, but Mousy was just too good. <laughs> he bought a bass, and the day he bought it, he could play it. You know, it was just, <laughs> so I had to start learning the guitar. And around that time, I went up to the youth club, and there was lads up there that I knew that were older than us. And uh, Paul Kniff was there, and he was in my brother John's class, and Sean, his brother Sean was in my class, so I knew the family. And Davy Carton was there, and I knew him from playing soccer up in the brother's yard. And Gerald Keaton, I knew all the Keatons, and Paul Rafe. So I knew them, and I went up to, I heard they had a band, and they were rehearsing in the youth club. And I, I just couldn't believe it. I thought, here is the kind of band that I've loved so much. You know, we were listening to the Ramones, and the Clash, and the Stranglers, and God knows who else. And here was Blaze X in tune. And they were fully formed. They had all these brilliant songs. They had them arranged well. They were playing them well. It was aggressive. It was melodic. It was everything. So, God, I thought, this this is not the best thing in the world, but it's as good as anything else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And from then on, it was just, I was delighted to be a, in, a par, in a town full of talented people. And there were so many talented people to be surrounded by. And... From going to gigs, I'd been to gigs in Leisureland and Seapoint at that stage and then getting in, uh, interested and loving Blaze X. I just wanted to be a part of the whole thing. I would have been happy, really, 
you know, doing the sound or the lights or something. I, I just wanted to be a part of the whole circus vibe. So learning the guitar was one of those parts. And Blaze X was a special, special band. It was magical. Anyone that saw them or heard them knows how good they were. It's hard to describe it. But they didn't last very long. And in 1981, Davey got married and Blaze X stopped. So in 1986, 87-ish, there was other stuff going on. I was playing with Too Much of the White Men, which was another brilliant band. Mm. And I started exploring some of the old Blaze X songs, which I knew were brilliant, and songs Davy had written that were left over and nobody had heard since. So that's really where this, the, the Saw Doctor started out of the remnants of Blaze X. Okay. okay. And uh, Mary O'Connor was the original uh, lead singer. She was Davy's neighbour from St. <coughs> Joseph's Park. So the first... The first combination of Saw Doctors was Mary, Davy, and myself. We did uh, some kind of a benefit for Toome Theatre Guild in the Imperial Hotel. And there's a photograph in the Toome Herald of the three of us singing two or three of Davy's songs yeah. uh, from that night. And that was the first time there was anything called the Saw Doctors. And so what was the, so what was the, the, the lineup? So Mary was on vocals. You that were was on it. guitar, yeah, and Davy on guitar as well. Yeah, I, well, yeah. At, originally I just played the guitar and they just sang. All oh, right, I, and I had a really bad copy of an Ovation guitar with a kind of <laughs> a back, uh, what you call it, a fiberglass back. It was terrible. Yeah. We had a terrible sound. <laughs> but we, got, <laughs> we had good songs and good yeah, singers. Yeah. That was the starting <laughs> of it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And and from there, how did other members come into the band? Um, we realised then we weren't making enough of a racket, okay. so. We had we had kind of concentrated on a song, a folk song Davy had written called All I Ever Wanted. And we decided we'd record that song. And we went to Tony Maher from The Conquerors. He had a studio up in Renmore. And Terps came with us. And at the time, Parik Stevens had come home from London and he was going to play the drums on it. And Terps was playing the guitar, so... Mousy wasn't in this band, so I was able to play the bass. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the, the four of us recorded that song, which is a really good recording. Yeah. And then Parik went back to London again, and Fergal McGrath, Red as we used to call him, yeah. he came in, and he started playing the drums with that lineup. And we did gigs in the Man of Varen, the Hairin, and McAvoy's, of course, at the time. McAvoy's was a very special kind of a music venue that. It developed from being an old man's pub into being a like session every night of every weekend and more. So it was brilliant. Where a was Mac Voice? It was the Hillsbrook. It was uh, I don't know what it's called now. I'm, I'm it's too not young. open I'm anymore. Don't even remember okay. that. Yeah. yeah, right. But it was um, it, it, Mousy got asked to go in and play a few songs in there by Philip McAvoy, and we started going in there ar around the time of Too Much of the White Man. Yeah. And uh, there was loads of people around the town singing. Seamus Rutledge would have been there, Jerry Henderson and Cuser and all these people that had songs. Again, we I was just so lucky to be surrounded by talented people. And we developed a set list in there and we used to do it Friday, Saturday, Sunday night and even an odd night during the week. And it was magic because it, it also developed our... Uh, awareness of how to perform and how yeah. which songs to play at the right time yeah. and and all that and like we, we we used to have people bouncing dancing on the floor at the end of every night like it was magic brilliant it's brilliant at what point in your life did you did you know that you're like okay this this could work this is this is what i'm going to do for the rest of my life yeah that's a good question i imagine when the Saw Doctors got offered to support the Water Boys. That was a big advancement of the plot, really, because the Water Boys were huge at the time. They were very exciting. Mm. They were unique. They were totally different to what had become had gone before them. And they asked us to be their support act, which meant that we got to do gigs in front of big crowds all around Ireland. And when we did the Sligo one, Mike Scott asked us, would we go to... Britain and do the six week tour of Britain the following spring which was in 1989 and yeah we said we'd, we'd have a go that was 
it meant uh, financial commitment. We had to get a loan. We had to do all that kind of stuff, get organised. Davy was working in Korma at the time and he had three kids and he had to leave the job. So it was a big jump for Davy to make. Yeah. But we sat around and spoke about it and we said, well, there's no point in 20 years' time telling people when they come into the pub what we could have done, yeah. <laughs> you know, if we only did it, you know. So we said we're going to avoid that at all costs and take the plunge and see what we can do. So that was... That kind of put us into some kind of professional situation. Yeah. Mm. But we'd been going, we'd been doing um, stuff for, you know, a good two and a half, three years before that. Like, but that gave you your push. Yeah. Yeah. It did. It, it meant like we had done, and even at that stage, the Waterboys gigs, you would get a hundred pounds to do support and. You'd have to pay your travel. You might have to stay over. Then we had to do the same thing in England. So we had probably the best part of 100, maybe not 100, but 70 or 80 gigs done as the Saw Doctors before you could ever say you made any money. Like, and it's, yeah. it's the kind of commitment, unfortunately, for original bands that they have to make. And, and as you get older, we were lucky. We were young enough. But as you get older, that commitment gets more difficult because it takes yeah. a lot of time. And... You don't really get uh, financially rewarded for for what you do until you start selling tickets, and you don't sure. start selling tickets until people know who you are and they like you. So it's, yeah. it takes a lot of building up to do. Yeah, and yes. it's a big sacrifice as well, isn't it? Well, it wasn't just it is in a way, but it wasn't draw. a sacrifice to us because we just loved it. Yeah, and 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 everyone everyone in the band was the same. It was a total priority. This okay. is what we want to do, and we love it, and we. Um, I'd say we'd have kept doing it for a good while afterwards anyway, even even if nothing came out of it, mm-hmm. because we just loved doing it so much. But it was lovely that it progressed so much, because we saw that when the band played it, people came towards us. It's a very simple uh, thing to <laughs> observe, but yeah. they did, and they smiled. And the big thing about that is the songs. We were lucky that we had songs that people liked, and the songs make the friends for you. Yeah. It's, it's the most important thing. I think... How you sing them, how you play them, how you present them, lighting, stage and all that. That's all important eventually, but it's all kind of secondary. If you have songs that people like, they come towards you, they start singing along and all of a sudden you have something that's rolling. like, yeah. And it's a lovely feeling. Mm. Just the, the Saw Doctor's name as mm. like for a band name in Ireland. Today, I think it's it's like a household staple household name like if you mention the Saw Doctors anywhere yeah people will always go oh yeah I, I, I know the Saw Doctors like I've, I love their stuff but how how did I that can't name? stand them <laughs> <laughs> how, how how did the Saw Doctors name get brought to the fore as I remember it I was at a party and there was a cousin of the ODs uh, Sharky was his name his nickname and he used to be around town and uh, cleaning chimneys and he told me this story about somebody who was working back in Tahrir Sawmills he was extremely lazy so the boss called him aside one Monday morning handed him a white coat and he said look you're important you're a saw doctor now that's that, let that be a motivation for you you're important in this outfit now we didn't know what a saw doctor was and nobody uh, obviously there are real saw doctors yeah. but we didn't know at the time but I met Sharky about somewhere in the middle about 10 years ago maybe 15 years ago and I told him how he had given the name to the band the night he told me the story yeah. in the, at the party and he had no recollection of the story whatsoever so <laughs> now I wonder if I remember it correctly <laughs> or where it came from I don't know that's gas <laughs> that's brilliant that's brilliant yeah <laughs> oh. I want to um, go back to only a couple of weeks ago, it was it three weeks ago um, or so? Yeah, the 30th anniversary of I Used to Love Her, which, when it was released, topped the Irish charts for nine weeks consecutively, I think. Yeah. It? Was there a previous version of that song? Which Was that well, originally a Blaze X song or a Too Much for the White Man song or something? Or Well, that, that this is a... a absolute demonstration of what I was saying earlier about the yeah. Saw Doctors came from Blaze X. The chorus of I Used to Love Her was a Blaze X song. Okay. And it was always just really catchy and, and we all loved it, but it was, it was very short. There was only 
the cor- what's what ended up being the chorus of the, the new song, and and another verse just as long as that. It was about a minute and twenty five seconds long. The, like. the whole song. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and it's on. The, there is a Blaze X version on the B side of the single. Okay. Yeah. Which we co- which we left at the original spelling. That's why the R. Saw Doctors I Used to Love is spelt differently to distinguish it from the original song. Okay. And we started to make, we were uh, in Kenny's recording a few songs we'd written and there was Davy and Terps and Porrick and myself. And we started writing these verses about the girl in the church and having a great laugh. And we got as far as the end of a verse and we were thinking, what would the chorus be? What would the chorus be? And someone said, what about that old Blaze X song, like that, that was a great chorus. Like yeah. nobody's ever heard it really. Yeah. So we tried it, and it just fitted hand in glove. So that was Blaze X meeting the Saw Doctors again, and to my, um, to my mind, it's the only song that is credited with all three of. Paul Kniff, Davy Carrington and Porrick Stevens having co-written it. Okay. And the, I think the it's... Re-release. Su- the well, the Saw Doctors version. Doctor's version. version. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. So I think that's not a coincidence of, of its success because the three lads had such amazing songwriting talent yeah, and, yeah. and it, each of them had their own little styles or their own strengths. Yeah. And I used to love her brought all those things together of their three talents and you know, maybe it's a pity they hadn't written a few more songs together. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. How yeah. did you ap- approach the the writing of that song differently as opposed to the Blaze X version of that song when you went into the studio? Well, the, as we were kind of interested in country music at the time. Davy and myself and Terps were listening to bands like Jason and the Scorchers and Steve Earle and um, Dwight Joachim. It was the mid-80s and there was a whole blast of kind of new traditional type country music out and it was brilliant so we had started kind of writing songs in in a country style and and that's what i used to love her was in you know it's a kind of a country song really mm. and uh that's that's why we were writing that kind of a song and we we're just having the crack you know yeah i mean it was never meant to be we we never wanted to be number one we we weren't aiming at that. We just wanted to put out a single. And the bands we loved in general weren't number one acts. You know, there were um, there were bands like I mentioned there. And they were bands that would come to town, do a really good gig, put out an album that people liked, put out an odd single that might, you know, get a bit of notice. It wouldn't it wouldn't be necessarily be a hit. We didn't need it to be a hit because we loved them anyway. Yeah. And it being a hit would only draw more people into them that wouldn't really understand them, you know. Yeah. So we we didn't put out singles to be number one. So it was a bit of a, it was a strange thing that happened. <laughs> How did it feel when you were told that your song went to number one and stayed at number one for nine weeks? Yeah, it was a, it was a strange feeling. Everything, everything kind of went into fast mode. Yeah. Because everybody wants the number one band to play in their venue and everybody wants them to appear here and there and it got very fast and it was brilliant for our career because it gave us a really solid platform people knew who we were people just know know your name I mean it's lovely to have good songs like I was saying earlier but like one song brings you an awful distance and it gave us a really good platform to work off and it was very exciting, but it wasn't the most enjoyable, I would say. Like for me, the gigs were the most important thing. Playing the songs at the gigs. Good songs, played well, and having this gig that just works. I, that would have done me. And and that's what I loved about it. And I even liked the smaller gigs. The lads used to be always slagging me because we'd be on tour in America in particular and... and it's hard to sell tickets in America on weeknights because people are very, very determined about getting to work early in the morning. Mm. So when we would go to America, the gigs in the bigger cities where we knew we'd do well were always put in Friday, Saturday and Sunday, maybe not even Sunday. So you'd be playing gigs in smaller towns in really small venues, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, whatever. And I used to love them because the people that would come and see you on a weeknight really loved the band. 
And even though there were small crowds in small venues, they were they were just really lovely really things. Yeah, yeah, and and, right and warm. Yeah, everybody yeah. was there for the right reason because yeah. no matter what you do on a Saturday night, you might sell a load of tickets, but there's a certain amount of those people are there for the night out. Yeah. But the people on a Tuesday night are there for the band. So cool. it, I yeah. used to love that. That's nice. Just um, when you mentioned America there, you did a lot of traveling in America with the Saw Doctors. Um, what, what are the highlights of, for you, of tour in America? Uh, well, those gigs, yeah. I used to love them, like, and the lads would be laughing. We might be doing a <laughs> festival gig at the weekend, and, yeah. and a great buzz and all that, but I'd be saying, it's Tuesday night there, and I was lovely. Tuesday night, you're on the corner. <laughs> it was special, <laughs> like. Yeah. But, it, well, with a band, you never know where the highlights come, yeah. because the, the, some gigs are just extra special. I'd say about 5% of gigs are extra special. Mm. Where, where everything just explodes into brilliance like and everything just flows and gets higher and higher but that can happen any day yeah yeah and it cannot happen any day so you just enjoy those things where it's you know it's it's when the stars are in the right alignment yeah, that kind align. of thing in with your american following do you think that there was an awful lot of kind of irish abroad that were just loved the the kind of everyday situations that came up in your songs and the lingo in your songs that were just saying, I can really relate to that. Do you think that was the main thing or did you find that it was an awful lot of Americans that just loved it? Well, at the start, it was only Irish because okay. they were the only ones who ever heard of us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when we went for the first few visits, it was playing in wherever we could. But um, we, we had played a few rock clubs and we realised if we were to keep our Irish audience but bring them to the rock club. We might bring other fans okay. in with them. And what that did happen. So the more we kept going back, the more people brought their friends to the next gig and then they brought their friends. And we were very persistent about it. And the more <laughs> we went back, more and more of a mixture of people came. So in the in the end, it was more like a, you know, it's more like an American audience, really. Yeah, yeah. But it took time. I, I can mm. imagine. I can imagine that took time. Very enjoyable time. <laughs> yeah. At the time, back then, am I right in saying, like, do you think, what's your opinion of this? Do you think a lot of bands took themselves maybe too seriously and, and you were kind of just, you know, you didn't take yourselves as serious and, you know, you wrote songs about everyday life in Ireland and, you know, it seemed like you were having the, there was crack in your songs and, you know, there was fun in your songs. Do you, like, what what inspired that approach? I think it's just um, the kind of people we are. Yeah. Uh, we just definitely, if there was fun to be had, put our name down for it. You know, it's yeah. like if there's a bit of a laugh, a bit of slag. We like being serious. We like having serious songs. We like having all kinds of songs. But we're mm. definitely not going to throw one away because there's humour in it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, sure. and, and we're all the time, if, if it made us laugh... We'd do it. Uh, like, we did write songs that made us laugh that nobody else laughed at. Well, you know, they didn't, <laughs> they didn't get very, you, you know, you don't, yeah. all your songs don't work. So you throw them aside and you, you keep the ones that people like and don't be nine them with the other ones. <laughs> <laughs> the, your song N17, um, obviously that involves Anthony Tisselswet. Yes. kind of, came to join the band is there a bit of a story behind recording that in windmill in dublin yeah mike scott promised <laughs> us he'd record our first single and it'd be n17 and okay. so he we booked windmill two it was off stevens green and i think we got overnight uh rates we we worked through the night kind of thing so mike said it'd be great to have a bit of sax at the end mm. and davy came up with the sax riff and he said i'll ring Antoine. i'll see would he come in so uh I suppose Mike said we'd we'd be ready for you at about nine o'clock, you know, on a whatever evening it was. And Andrew said, Grant, he said, I'll go in and have a pint in the next door and give us a shout when you need me. But you're, we were very busy doing the track. <laughs> you forgot about and, Anto. Uh, <laughs> there wasn't time to call him until maybe, you know. <laughs> go, out, go out next door there and tell Anto we're ready for him at about 12 o'clock maybe <laughs> <laughs> and Anto came in and he started blowing the sax you could see he was sweating more more than normal <laughs> but he played it brilliantly <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. oh god I, 
want to um, I want to ask you obviously I'm I'm 25 years of age Dylan is 25 years of age so we're very young on the grand scheme of things but all my life growing up in Tume I've heard of the West Awake the West Awake gig down still yeah. to this day still to this hear day stories about it's like yeah. that apparently it was biblical as such <laughs> <laughs> um, could, could you tell us more about that well it's a real case of the stars aligning yeah because we had been playing in tune in those gigs we did I remember in um, Stephen's Night we did a gig down in the Protestant uh, venue Protestant Cathedral venue you know mm. the, what do you, the yeah, Synod Hall yeah you know, it was a good gig and people were at it and all that. And that would have been, uh, when would that have been? It would have been uh, Christmas 89. So then in 90, um, we hadn't played in tune mm. in, in, in the beginning of 1990. And then the single came out in the summertime and then it went to number one and, and all that. We still hadn't played in tune. And uh, we had been down to Fela and Thurles in July 1990 and thought, God, wouldn't it be brilliant if you could do something on a smaller scale in tune? Yeah. So it, it, it couldn't happen nowadays. In, in six weeks, Ollie Jennings, the manager of the Saw Doctors, took mm. it on board and he started to put together the West Awake. And it happened. And we had... Um, no, that was 91, sorry. 91, 91 yeah. sorry, I'm missing a year. And we still hadn't played in Tume in 91 either, I don't think. <laughs> so there was a, there was a demand <laughs> and we had success. And I Used to Love Her had been number one and we put out Hey Rap, which I, was actually number one for a week. <laughs> uh, the week of, of uh, the West Awake. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so this gig was happening in, in September 1991. We hadn't played here. We got a great bill. The Hot House Lords said they'd come. The Stunning came. Uh, Park Stevens played. We had the Colons. We had Paddy Glacken. We j- they all came kind yeah. of as favours. Yeah. So it was a really good bill. You had this. You had the Saw Doctors coming back to Tune. Down in the stadium. We got a really good, uh, what you call it, uh, big top. And that was all going well, like. But... The crowning glory was not alone that. The weather was the best it had been the whole year. Like it was the 7th of September and this Indian summer heat wave hit the town about three days before the gig hit the country. So that just threw petrol on the fire and (laughs) everything about it was brilliant. Except we didn't play that well. (laughs) But it didn't matter in this, like that's a tiny little thing of that doesn't matter whatsoever because the occasion of it and the amount of people it brought to town it, yeah. you know the, I think the, the the big top could hold between eight and 9,000 people and there was probably 20,000 people in town as happens oh. I, that's what I didn't realise that's what happens when you put on an event that people like other people just come to town like yeah. Yeah. and everything went well everything it couldn't have been better and it was just one of those things that people remember very fondly because they had a great time so did we that's it's one of those things that you hear it all the time it's just it must have meant so much to the people of the town I think it was it was um, very um, pleasurable for them to think that that it was all homegrown and yeah. that it could attract so many people from elsewhere to have such a good time. Yeah. And, yeah, it was... It, it, you never hear anyone saying it. People come up to me all the time and say, oh, the West Awake, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's, it was magical. And playing that gig, well, what the, what's it like standing on a stage playing to your home crowd? Well, what thoughts go through your head? And it's not C, G, D. It's, uh, you know what I mean? I don't know what, I don't know what you'd be thinking at that stage because I found when I was on stage, I was really enjoying something that's going well, but I was always thinking about how you're going to keep it going. Now, yeah. Yeah. Like is, there, is there something you need to do to talk to people, keep them with you? Do you need to get the songs started really quickly? It's always about um, enjoying it, but thinking about 
making sure that it stays good, it stays good yeah. Yeah. or if you can keep it getting better you know it's mm. so it's um that's what I'd be thinking about. I'd be kind of working. <laughs> like, yeah. Working the head like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do I have to make an idiot out of myself here now just to break, get people's attention or something? You know? Yeah. You must have felt very proud though to put on a gig of that calibre and pull it off. Oh God, yeah. Because it, it was, it was a magic occasion and I mean, we were only a small part of it. The weather was probably the biggest part, and and the people that organised it was the biggest was a huge part. And then the crowd was was so important because they just came out and made sure they enjoyed themselves. They they threw themselves at it with the abandon, like yeah, yeah. And people camped down the palace, and they camped anywhere they could get a bit of get a bit of uh, grass, and they camped in people's front gardens and you know there was all that kind of stuff going on madness, madness yeah madness. Mm. sounds absolutely fantastic yeah. mm. I wish I was there yeah same same <laughs> we missed out big time yeah there's um there's one other thing um that has always been mentioned to me like even learning to play music myself at a, at a younger age in in Tume is you'd always hear oh yeah and oh, where are the lads oh sure the boys are gone on tour with the saw doctors they're over to England or over to the mm. States or whatever. That you were, you seem to be fantastic for bringing homegrown talent on the road. Well, we were very lucky to be brought by the Water Boys. Yeah. And one of the things the Water Boys did on that tour was they put us on the, the catering list so that we got fed every day <laughs> at, at the venue. Yeah. And that was the thing, that was a tradition we always kept going yeah. with, with anybody else we brought but but it was always lovely it, it's the exact same philosophy as we always had and I still have it's like people in Tume are very talented and mm. we're not saying they're the greatest in the world but they're as good as anybody else oh, of course <laughs> and yeah. let them I think if they get a chance and they can be heard they'll make friends and they definitely did over the years so many different acts made friends like it was a, it was a pleasure to have them around as well. It was mm. always good crack to, yeah. And and another thing about it is, when you have lads fall on the tour as a support act, um, it's great crack because they have never been there before. And while we have, might have gone around England a, a number of, a good few times, like they'd be there with new eyes on everything that's going on. So. I'd be hanging around with them and just seeing how, what they're seeing and how they're getting on. Because, with them. because in a lot of ways, what we were doing was um, was very well routined. Yeah. And we had got into a way of doing it. And, and um, it was always interesting to see how younger fellas would tackle it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that, was, that was good. That was a good part of all that as well. Like. Do you think um, that the, there's still bands going to this day that that she um, would have helped out and brought on the road with you do you think if you didn't do that for the bands and give them that opportunity that they might not have had the opportunity to play in front of big, big enough crowds and may have decided to pack it in like at some stage like I know we, we in a previous episode we had we had Darrow D mm. and da one of the things that Darrow D said to us was the Saw Doctors brought the Kunicks on the road and he said if that didn't happen it they may they may not have continued it do you think that was that was a part to play in it to give them that opportunity and to keep them playing well I think any any tour you do is amazing because if you record your first gig and your last gig you're a different band yeah it's different than doing an odd gig here and there a tour really tightens you up it mm -hmm. makes it makes something of you but I have to say Nobody got brought on a tour just because they were from Tume. Oh, no. They I, got brought because... They were good enough. They were from Tume and they were as good as anybody else you could get. Yeah, yeah. And if they weren't good enough, we would have had to get somebody else. But yeah. we did, you know, so that was the good thing about it. In a way, you were lucky that you had home yes. and good enough. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing. Leo, being a guitarist myself, can I talk to you a little bit about... Um, the talking Lee to the wrong man. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to talk to you a little bit about the, the Leo Moran guitar sound. Yeah. So, like, from my ear, like, I, I kind of hear, you know, you're synonymous with using the, the Vox AC30. Yeah. With, with the tremolo effect. Yeah, that's the Yamaha. Okay. 
What what inspired that sound? Um, when the Saw Doctors were starting and we had done the few acoustic gigs and uh, like I said earlier, we weren't making enough for a racket. We had no <laughs> oomph. We said, geez, we better uh, go electric. <laughs> so John Brennan was in a band called The Nemo's <laughs> and uh, the band was, F- Fergal McGrath was in as well. Jared Francis was a cousin of John Brennan's and Paul Grealish was the guitar player. Yeah. And they were around in Blaze X time, defunct. But I somehow found out that John Brendan was selling an amp and he wanted £100 for it. Sounds all right. We didn't know what it was. Davy was buying it, actually. It's Davy's amp. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we bought this amp, heard it. Davy's a greater plug in. Yeah, geez, that's grand. Yeah, that sounds nice. So we brought it home and we were up in Davy's house and she said, look, there's... Um, there's tremolo on it as well. <laughs> and we were going, Jesus, try that. Jesus, that's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> that's like uh, Roy Orbison or, you know, that yeah. 60s. So that's where that sound came from. It's Davy's amp, the Yamaha amp. And I still have, I won myself and that one, the original is still around. And it, it did every, every gig except Australia. Well, not every gig, but nearly every gig. Yeah, and it's just a, <laughs> and it, and it, you can buy them online for about two hundred quid. Like nobody has any value on them. Yeah, yeah. But it it was the sound of the Saw Doctors. It was yeah. on the on the first album. It was it won't be tonight and Red Cortina and those mm-hmm. things. And yeah. and the beauty about it is, um, I'm not a complicated guitar player to say the least. And it it's a, it's a kind of a sound that lends itself to simple riffs. Yeah. And and another thing I have to say is a lot of the riffs were made up by Davy whistling them, and I just he said, "Well, oh. you could play this," and I go, "It's very hard to distinguish that a pitch of high pitch." <laughs> and he'd be whistling like this, and eventually, and I and I go, "Don't don't no no," he goes, and I go, <laughs> and anyway, it would get worked out. And a lot of the, a lot if not most of the riffs that I played were that's where they came from. Wow. The whistle. I didn't know that, yeah. yeah. The whistle. And then the 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 Vox, I started using the Vox because you couldn't be playing the tremolo all night. It's kind of a lovely song, but it's a, it's a kind of a, you know, it's not for all night. So I started using the Vox AC30, but I found yeah, there was an output from the Yamaha, so I could put the Yamaha through the AC30 and have it louder. Nice. <laughs> the two amps together. Yeah. Nice. Brilliant. Brilliant. <laughs> I'm going to ask you a question, and I... It might sound like a funny question or a strange question to ask, but what is your favourite Saw Doctor song and why? I love Same Old Town. Yeah. Because we got so renowned and so well known for having the phone and and having songs with kind of humour in them, whatever. And I I like serious songs as well. So I think Same Old Town for me was... A good effort at kind of balancing it all out. It, I think it's a good song anyway. It is a I like the song. song. So it's a great song. I like all the rest of them. And, and I, yeah. Be different every day, but but that one always comes to mind for me as regards something a bit uh, deep. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, but it's funny. That's a funny thing now. What uh, after coming to me, um, there's kind of underlying humour in it as well. It, it's funny when when the real sad verse comes. Uh, or not the not the real sad verse, but you'd often wonder as the year go past why you ever why'd you ever bother going to mass? If you if you sing that in a in a room like this to people, they start laughing, even though it's so serious. But mm. they laugh when they see themselves. That's what I've found with with all kinds of songs or any kind of art. People relating to if it. they see themselves in a the mirror, they laugh. Yeah, <laughs> and, and and that's what you're trying to do with songs is is show them themselves like yeah. something. That, that we all have in common that's brilliant yeah. I, I never it's not until you're after saying that there like mm. that I, I realise like the actual people listening to a song and seeing themselves in a mirror yeah. mm. it, that's absolutely brilliant that's brilliant. partly why most of your songs were that's why you, were, you, you the Saw Doctors as a band were so successful because people could relate to yeah. the lyrics and the stories in the songs yeah and people said it wouldn't travel but sure we grew up listening to foreign songs about different cultures and we all love them. Yeah. Like we love, foreign is exotic. Yeah. I mean, you people in America think that like the Saw Doctors would think Chum is a tourist destination. <laughs> 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 They've come 
to hear. Like, and, yeah. and to be fair, they've enjoyed it. Mm. Yeah. You know. And it can be. Yeah. yeah. It can be. Yeah. Depends but, what you're looking for. Yeah. I heard uh, one of your poems recently. Um, yeah, well, Would you be well, willing to it's to kind recite of a, a bit for us? Yes, yeah, kind of not really a poem. It's one of those things I, I love. Um, in later years, I used to only ever listen to music as art, as my interest in art, because... I just loved it so much. Yeah. But now in later years, I find I've, I'm more likely to put on um, a documentary or Sunday miscellany or something on the radio that's kind of spoken word, educational, interesting yeah. kind of thing. So that's what I've been doing. And I always listened to Sunday miscellany and I always thought I'd have a go at submitting something to see would it make the program. I never thought it would. And I submitted uh, this thing in way back in, the, in springtime. And it had gone about two or three months and heard nothing about it. And then I got a phone call from the producer, Sarah Binchy, and she said, would I, would I record it tomorrow? I was going, Jesus. <laughs> I was, and I was kind of happy that, it, that I had made, that I wasn't, um, that I'd got over my cowardice of actually submitting it. And that mm. had done it for me. I didn't really need to, to make the program. I was just didn't want to not submit it yeah mm. and I almost didn't but anyway it made the program and I was delighted it's, it's great. a beautiful it's a, piece well so. I don't know about that but <laughs> I'll, I'll do it so sure okay what's the title of this I call it uh, that was the river after the water boy song this is the sea lovely do you know um, that song I do and I thought they might play that song after because they always play an associated uh, piece of music after uh, after each written piece push and do they they play the N17 instead oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, anyway okay this is how it goes I haven't read this in a while so okay. I, I'm not sure so I'm standing on the bridge over the town's river looking at the modest but crystal clear flow of a few inches of water over the stony bed just as I would have done when I was 12 years old it's no Mississippi or Volga but it's our river on which the town was founded. It was deemed decent enough even for Rory O'Connor, the last high king of Ireland, to have his wonderful castle built on its banks about 850 years ago. When you're growing up, the grandeur of your surroundings isn't of major importance. Your home is your home. Its scale is secondary consideration. You don't know any different. To us, Turnadaly Hill was the steepest hill in the world and Mike McGuff was the world's tallest man. Our shallow river, the Nanny, runs under this bridge and on through the town, is sidetracked in by the old mill where the wooden wheel has been restored only recently, past the tasteful and solemn little garden where two standing stones remember Anne-Marie McHugh, our town's victim of the Twin Towers attack. Then, on between the builder's yard and the shopping centre, out beneath the main road where it passes the Garda station on the right and out into the country, underneath the railway bridge, to after which it joins the River Clare. The Clare flows to Loch Corrib and the lake empties into the River Corrib, which flows with great gusto and energy through Galway City and out into the bay and the Atlantic Ocean. The Atlantic is connected to every other ocean on the planet. It may seem like a very simple primary school geography lesson, but it's one of the ways by which we understood our connection to the rest of the world. I can remember standing here as a youth with vague visions and fantasies of a life of travel and adventure to places unknown and even unimaginable, though images on cinema and television screens would have planted some seeds. I was always drawn to the lingering sunsets in the western sky at this time of year. Growing up, the oldest child, to, the youngest child to parents who had lost their eldest eight-year-old son to a simple but tragic accident the year before I was born, influenced my ambitions. I was understandably encouraged to be cautious and careful, to be aware and even fearful of strangers and the unknown. No climbing trees for me and cycling and swimming were never flavours of the month either. My mind struggled between a powerful desire to explore and learn and the apprehension of the unknown. In the intervening four decades, 
I'm lucky to be able to say that three of those decades were filled with the exhilarating travel and adventure to countless places around the globe. Not only that, but they happened in a dream come true fashion, coming as a result of doing the thing I loved the most from that age, playing music. And there was nothing to fear any more than if I'd stayed at home. Legendary playwright Tom Murphy grew up here as well. And when he left to swim in a bigger pond, he said that he had encountered every character he needed for a lifetime of writing plays in his hometown. I imagine most hometowns offer similar raw material. This sunny but cool spring day standing once again over the River Nanny. Many of my travels are as far in the past as they were in my 12-year-old's future. Today, my immediate travel range is just about the same as it was back then, when we had football training, soccer in the schoolyard and the snooker hall, amongst other activities to keep us occupied. But the time is flying. We're healthy and enjoying the adjusted lifestyle in many ways, developing a new appreciation and knowledge of how essential and non-essential many things are. Turner Daly Hill still knocks the breath out of me, and Mike McGuff is still a giant of a man, though I haven't seen him in a few weeks. That's brilliant. lovely. That's, That's beautiful. Lovely. Thanks very much for that, Leo. Thanks that so much, Leo. Thank you. I just you. Um, part of that was Tom Murphy. Yeah. saying that he met every character in yeah. the town. Do you think that was the same for the Saw Doctors? Oh, yeah. I think so. Tom was uh, obviously more uh, clever and complex about it. He said he used to, he used to mingle them together. He used to, comp- he used to create composite characters. <laughs> so he might have your sense of humour with your whatever, and, and he'd, he'd, he'd mix them all together. Cool. We kept it a bit. We weren't up to that kind of uh, complexities. <laughs> <laughs> a bit simpler, but yeah. oh, it's amazing. I'm sure he much. met a few presentation borders in his time as well. I'd say so. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. That was lovely. Not at all. Thanks a million. We might uh, try something slightly different. Um, we do this in every episode, Leo. It's called the quick fire round. So it's a series of questions I'm going to throw at you, <laughs> and you're going to bounce back really quick. Some of them are kind of random and funny, but you give it a go. I hope the answers are funny, not random. You ready? Go on. Okay. McDonald's or Supermax? Supermax. Guinness or Murphy's? Guinness. Quite Night In or Mad Night Out? Either. <laughs> Death Row Meal? Ooh. Vietnamese noodle soup. Lovely. <laughs> <laughs> Long or short? Short. Sweet or savoury? Savory. Dogs or cats? Both. What's your guilty pleasure? Guilty pleasure. Magnum. <laughs> Mondays or Fridays? Mondays. Looks or personality? Personality. And what is your favourite record? Favourite record? I don't have one, but I have a lot of I have a lot of ones I love. Cheapers. One that keeps coming up. I, I'm not supposed to be expanding here, but <laughs> great album, man. He's, he wouldn't be my favorite artist or anything, but Jackson Brown's uh, "Running on Empty" is just a fabulous album, start to finish, and it fits together, and it's just it's amazing. It's fantastic. I, it. I haven't I heard it. it. Oh, it's class. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's really. I'll good. check that out. <laughs> yeah, Deadly. brilliant, Leo. Thank you so much. Yeah, that has been. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're off the hook much. now. You're <laughs> off the hook. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thanks yeah, for thanks joining us. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Great um, to have you. That has been episode five, season one of the Turf Shed podcast. I'm Evan Barrows. I'm Dylan Conley. I'm Leo Morn. <laughs> and thanks for watching. I'd like to say a massive thank you to Reapy's Bar in Tume for letting us avail of the venue today. I'd also like to say a massive thank you to Dylan Brady, our go- tech guru. Te- tech guru. Yeah. For all his behind the scenes work. Thank you. For? I'm just talking to the barman there. All right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Reapies is currently closed, lads. <laughs> Cheers. That's Cheers. it. That's, that's it. You're listening to the Turf Shed Podcast with Dylan Connolly and Evan Burrows. Available on all streaming platforms.